All in. Up until the Georgetown and Pitt games, Jim Thorpe had been known as what sports writers call an in-and-outer, the kind of player who could look great one day and be a no-factor the next. Now it was clear that Thorpe was all in. As one player put it, he plays football with the abandon of a man having called all the competitors outclassed. If Jim's growing celebrity affected him, no one noticed. Around campus, he was exactly the same. Quick smile, easygoing, clowning with friends. And when not in uniform, he dressed the same. He always went around looking so raggedy, classmate Rose Denholm remembered. He had an old, long, raggedy coat he always wore. But he was always happy. He could be so very jolly, another female student agreed. He enjoyed dancing, although he did certainly didn't seem to be a ladies' man. All the girls had a crush on him, one friend recalled. According to football teammate Henry Roberts, even this didn't go to Jim's head. He treated all the girls alike, Roberts said. Actually, there was one woman who stood out to Thorpe. An 18-year-old student named Iva Miller, born in Indian Territory. Miller's father was Irish. Her mother part Cherokee. Maybe. Iva's parents died when she was five, and her aunt enrolled her in a local Indian school, reporting that Iva was part Indian on her mother's side. To this day, no one knows if this was true. It was not unheard of for white parents to sneak kids into Indian boarding schools, which offered free room and board. Whatever her background was, Iva grew up in Indian schools, had her own brush with fame when she was chosen to represent her school at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. At age 11, she performed in the Indian Territory Building, singing songs and reciting poems for curious crowds. She became friends with the Indian exhibit's main draw, the famous Apache leader Geronimo. Born along what is now the Arizona and New Mexico border, Geronimo had led an armed resistance against the settlers on traditional Apache land. He had finally surrendered to U.S. forces in 1886, on condition that he be allowed to live out his years on the Apache Reservation in Arizona. The government broke its promise, holding him instead as a prisoner of war. During the World's Fair, he lived in a teepee outside the Indian Territory Building, where he demonstrated how to make bows and arrows, sold postcards of himself, and sometimes to the delight of tourists, danced with Iva Miller. In 1909, Miller transferred to the Carlisle School to study nursing. She was smart, outgoing, active in campus clubs, the secretary of the Girls' Debating Society, and, her daughter would ladies say, the prettiest girl at Carlisle. Jim Thorpe thought so. When a teammate introduced Jim to Iva, his first words were, you're a cute little thing. She was not impressed. Pop Warner was impressed, but didn't show it. In long afternoon practices, Warner pushed his undefeated team to keep improving. If he didn't like what he saw, he would take an old place on the line and butt their heads with anyone who looked timid. You bonehead! The red-faced coach roared when the players made mistakes. I'll knock your block off! Warner's vowed a quick cursing long forgotten. He hurtled as sharp as barbs at his best player. Lazy Indian, he shrieked at Thorpe. You don't want to learn, you just want to pout. Thorpe flashed a casual grin. He knew infuriated his coach and said, I'm satisfied. I'll tell you what to do, and you started a bait. Thorpe was approaching the game more seriously than ever, even getting up early to jog the hilly roads around campus. But out on the field, everything seemed to come easily, and something about that rub popped the wrong way. Jim was always a carefree sort of chap, and never took things too seriously, Warner would later say. He was naturally bright, Pop added, but he had a pretty strong aversion for work. I also had a strong aversion for getting beat. Thorpe fired back, and I did right in avoiding that. Next up for Carlisle was 5-0 Lafayette College, a strong team that had not allowed a touchdown in two years. The streak ended abruptly when Carlisle came to town. In another dominating win, Jim Thorpe and the other starters played every down on offense, defense, and special teams. That was normal, but this time it cost them. Late in the game, his team up 19-0, Thorpe rolled his right ankle on a routine run. As he limped to the sidelines, he knew from the throbbing pain that the injury was serious. A doctor took a look at the swollen ankle and diagnosed a severe sprain. He told Thorpe to stay off the foot completely for two weeks. The next two games were against Pennsylvania and Harvard. All week, Thorpe hobbled around campus on crutches. He watched the practice from his least favorite spot, the bench. On Friday afternoon, he boarded the train, 
along with a team and a large group of students who'd saved up to make the trip to Philadelphia. Iva Miller was among them. She liked Jim, despite the awkward opening line. When the players had a pep rally in the lobby of their hotel the next morning, Iva came as Jim's special guest. That afternoon in the locker room of Franklin Field, Thorpe pulled on his uniform. He wanted to give it a go. Gamblers were more realistic. With Thorpe injured, they made Penn a heavy favorite. 30,000 fans watched Thorpe lip onto the field. They watched him loosen up and try to run. Warner watched it too, from much closer up. Every time Thorpe planted his right foot, his foot twitched in pain. Warner scratched him from the lineup. But this was no one-man team. Carlisle overwhelmed Penn with speed and teamwork. And Gus Welch, the most wonderful dodging Welch, as the Philadelphia Inquirer put it, never let the defense catch his breath. We used to call signals so fast the defense didn't have time to get lined up, he remembered. Alex Escia and Possum Powell carried the load running the ball, and Welch electrified the crowd by fielding a punt near his own goal line and snaking through the entire Penn team for a 95-yard touchdown. The final, Carlisle 16, Pennsylvania 0. Does it pay to educate the Indian? An Inquirer reporter heard as a fan wondered. No, 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 several answered. Not in football. Carlisle is now 8-0. Pop Warner's thoughts turned immediately to Harvard, a showdown the natural press was hyping as the battle of the year. Warner desperately wanted to win. He knew the players wanted it even more. Since first coming to Carlisle, the coach had sent something extra motivating his team, something beyond the typical desire to win football games. When playing against the best college teams, Warner would later theorize, trying to explain it this X factor. It was not them so much, like the Carlisle school against Pennsylvania or Harvard as the case might be, but it was the Indians against the white man. The Carlisle School is supposed to sever these young men in front of their heritage to kill the Indian in them, as Pratt had famously said, but fans and sports writers never let the players forget that they were Indians, and there's no evidence they wanted to forget. They did not call themselves the Carlisle Cardinals or the Carlisle Wildcats. These were the Carlisle Indians, and their desire to prove themselves their pride in who they were was especially strong when facing elite schools. They actually liked and admired Harvard. Anything was very good and was always commented on as Harvard style, Warner said of his players. But that didn't mean they thought the Harvard students were somehow better than they were, more worthy of equality or respect. We point this out to the game because it meant more to prestige than any other, Possum Powell later said. On the other hand, Harvard didn't consider us much. He was right. Harvard had a lifetime record of 11-1 against the Carlisle School, and the Crimson coach, Percy Hawkton, dismissed Carlisle's invade of as whiff-waff, telling reporters, We'll stick to barnyard football. Hawkton even hinted that he might not bother to play his starters, saving them for the upcoming games against Dartmouth and Yale. Was Hawkton serious or just gaming Warner? Pop had no idea. He wasn't even sure which of his own players would be on the field. The entire team was feeling the effects of Carlisle's grueling run of road games, and the theme all week on the sports pages was that the Indians had simply played too many tough games to compete with the ruler of the football universe, as papers called the bigger, fresher Harvard. Worst of all, of course, was the injury to Carlisle's biggest star, or as the Boston Globe dubbed him, crippled Jimmy Thorpe. Warner had refused to update the press on the state of Thorpe's ankle. He didn't want Percy Houghton to know that Thorpe could barely walk. Behind closed doors, he and Jim tried everything known to the early 20th century medicine, from massages and special ointments to electricity treatments and vibration machines. On Friday, Thorpe tested the leg on the practice field. Warner's heart sank. Jim, he said, you can't run on that ankle. Sure I can, Thorpe insisted. Warner take a closer look. The ankle was still swollen. Warner pointed out and Thorpe couldn't put his weight on it without wincing. Thorpe said, wrap it and I'll play.